Thank you for your conversation. Thank you. Give everybody a chance to uh, get to their classes. The uh, worksheets are on the table. They are paper clipped together, so if you haven't had a chance to grab them yet, go ahead and do that. I'm going to let you know uh, some of the updates that I made, as I mentioned in my announcements. The worksheets are also available on the Facebook channel. There's a link to the Google Docs, and you can uh, download that to your Word, and then you can manipulate it from there. Also, um, there will be clipboards next week, and so each week's lesson will be attached to the clipboard, and then you can fill it out on a clipboard and leave the clipboard behind, and then uh, we'll, we'll just keep doing that each and every week. We are improving this way of uh, communication, if you will, or teaching. I like it. It has uh, worked out really well compared to how we first started this in trying to fill in all the blanks. And I know there are a number of different types of learners. And so I'm trying to capture all the different learners through this format. Some are very visual, some like the lecture format, and so on. So we're just trying to make it easier for you to learn this stuff. We've been in inspiration the last couple of weeks, and my intention is to finish it up this week, and then next week, preservation, and then probably we'll close out with some things concerning the Bible, bibliology, and then we're going to move into theology proper, and we're going to talk about theology, that is to say, the study of God. A very important subject, now that we have the foundation of the Bible kind of laid out, now we can begin to build on top of all the doctrines that will follow in our study on systematic theology. And uh, so what I want you to do this morning is just turn real quick to Romans chapter 15. Romans 15. Romans 15. And the title of this section today is New Testament Support Internal Evidence. New Testament Support Internal Evidence. I believe I brought it out last week that we can go to many external sources to validate the Bible. We can look at archaeology, we can look at history, and even fulfilled prophecy as external evidences for the inspiration of Scripture. There is no other book on the face of the planet that has fulfilled prophecy like the Word of God does. And so that's one aspect of the external and internal evidence, the support for the inspiration of the Bible. Now, in Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4, the Bible says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And I'll read that again. But whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And so what is he referring to there? He's referring to the Old Testament. The things that were written before were written for our comfort, our hope, our learning. And so that is yet another piece in the many pieces that we have on why we should believe the Old Testament is just as applicable today. You know, sometimes we isolate certain portions of Scripture and we focus on that as only being relevant. We say maybe the Gospels are only relevant or Paul and his epistles are only relevant or we might section out some old part of the Old Testament and say that's relevant. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and all scripture is relevant and profitable. And so we look at Paul's words here to the church at Rome and we see that whatsoever was written before is profitable. And so again, it goes in line with what we've been teaching all along. And so the first thing that you see in your worksheet and the last sentence there, we talk about inspiration and we talk about the canon of scripture I say well how do we define what the canon of scripture is how do we figure out what inspiration is well we have to ask ourselves what does the word of God say I said last week I said the word of God self authenticates it it validates itself that's all the evidence that we need that's all the support that we need to believe 
the things that pertain to the Christian faith, the doctrines that pertain to the Christian faith. Once we go outside of that and we look for external sources to validate the scripture, then that external source becomes a higher authority than God's word. Does that make sense to you? If I'm going to some scholar and he's giving me validation for the word of God, then in many respects that puts him on a higher plane than the word of God. The word of God supersedes the scholar. The word of God is not in subjection to him. The scholar is in subjection to the word of God. And that goes across the board. It doesn't matter what branch of scholarship that you may be referring to. And so we look at the Canaan of Scripture. And I mentioned when we were talking about the Canaan of Scripture, and that was before the COVID thing happened. I think we had just finished up on the Canaan of Scripture. And I was referencing uh, Pastor Sargent's quote. Now, I don't remember where he got it. I don't know if it was Benjamin Warfield or, or some other a scholar that spent a lot of time talking about inspiration, but he said that the Canaan of Scripture, that is the rule, this is what we have right here, this is the Canaan of Scripture, all 66 books, the Canaan of Scripture was established by God and discovered by man. So the Canaan of Scripture was established by God and discovered by man. And then we come to inspiration. What does the Bible say about inspiration? Now, last week, I gave you a little challenge and said, when you're reading your Bible, make a note, maybe in your notebook or in the margin of your Bible, maybe underline it, uh, use one of those colored markers, and take a note of every time or every reference to inspiration. Every time there's a thus saith the Lord, or God commanded to write, or God spoke, take note of those and write them down, just, just a little bit of a note. Now, there's some things that I'm going to show you in a few minutes, and then I'm going to give you another lesson as you go through. I'll try to make this one a little bit easier for you. You know, reading the Bible is fun. You should enjoy reading and studying the Bible. There's a lot to glean from it. But I realize sometimes as you're reading through it, it just becomes sometimes a chore because you don't have a goal in mind. You're sort of just reading it for reading's sake. Well, if you start to implement some of these things as you're studying through the Bible, looking for these things as you're studying through the Bible, it'll give your time in the Word a little bit more enjoyment. So some of these things I'm going to mention to you, and then I'm going to follow up with a question. So as you go down your list in your worksheet, there are over 332 references to the Old Testament, quotations, references, or inferences to the Old Testament. So what does this show us? It validates the Bible's authenticity, its veracity, truthfulness, and, of course, it's inspiration. So there are 332 direct quotations or references to the Old Testament. We see it is written, found over 60 times in the New Testament, and that is in reference to the Old Testament. You'll notice as I go through these that there's no question about what they're quoting or referencing. There's no question as to its truthfulness or its inspiration. There's no question as to whether or not it is the word of God. It is stated with the, with the conviction that it is the very word of God. So we see it is written. Does anybody here remember who said that? The Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 4.4. 4. It is written. It is written. It is written. And we see here, have you not read? This occurs over seven times in the New Testament. Have you not read? So there's the authoritative aspect of it. You certainly wouldn't want to read something that has errors in it or some questionable material. Have you not read? Have you not read? So the, uh, the point is to direct you to what the Old Testament says and with authority. Then we see that it might be fulfilled, and that's found over ten times. And there's the prophetic element to the scriptures, that it might be fulfilled. And we see many of these in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly throughout the Old Testament, we see that storyline of redemption unfolding and pointing to the cross of Christ. And then we see the oracles of God, mentioned over four times in the Bible, the oracles of God. And here's your kind of your homework challenge, if you will, as you're reading the Bible. And what I'll do, I'll keep this real simple. 
when you read the Gospels, when you read the words of Christ, here's what I want you to do. Take your notebook out or your journal, whatever you use. And every time Jesus Christ references the Old Testament, in whatever form, whether it's a direct quotation or an inference, write that reference down. How many times he references the Old Testament? Remember, we, we're we looking to Jesus Christ as our example. And so we, we see Christ's example in his life and charity and his compassion toward those in particular that are sick. But what about Christ's teaching methods? How did Christ preach and how did Christ teach? And even more important, what was Christ's attitude towards the Old Testament scripture? And so as you read through the Gospels and you read through the words of Christ, and of course the book of Revelation, you read through the, those uh, sections of scripture, take note of how many times he references the Old Testament and in what context he mentions it. How does he approach the scripture? And what kind of example does that set for us as we look at Scripture? Should we approach Scripture with an attitude of skepticism? With a, with a mind to correct it? To change it? To maybe fit our moral set point or what we think religion should shouldn't be? Or should we conform to what the Scripture says? And it's always going to be we should conform to what the Scripture says. And so looking at Christ, we see that. Uh, interesting note, and it is in your, your notes, that Christ began the ministry with, it is written, found in Matthew chapter 4, verse number 4. And we also see that he closed out his ministry by saying the same words in Luke 24, verse number 46. Christ is our ultimate example. Christ held the scripture in high esteem, and as he, as he should, since he is the author of it. So this wasn't just a general view. He, and I wrote B in there. So you can just make that little correction in your notes. He believed and taught that the entire Old Testament canon was inspired, and he believed the same for the New Testament as well. He quoted the Old Testament. We see this here in uh, Matthew 4.4 4 and Deuteronomy 8.3. Deuteronomy 4.4, 4, Matthew 8, verse number 3. So again, I repeat. He quoted this with authority, and he quoted it with confidence. It is said by one source that he quoted the Pentateuch over 20 times. He also quoted the two verses more than any other. We see that in Hosea 6, verse 6, and we see that in Matthew 9, verse number 13. We also see Leviticus 19, verse 18, Matthew 5, verse 43, Matthew 22, verse 39, and then Mark 12, 31. Now, here, and I, I, let's turn here real quick. Let's go to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, the commandment of God. That should be your next space in your worksheet, commandment of God. And what did he call the commandment of God? What did he refer to the commandment of God as? Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, and we'll begin at verse number 8. So Mark 7, verse number 8, and the word of God says, For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. What has authority here? The commandment of God or the word of God or tradition? Of course, the answer to that is the word of God. So it goes on to say, verse number 10, he says, Moses said, honor thy father and thy mother, there's a quote, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corbin, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free, and ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God. See the transition? Mm -hmm. He went from the commandment of God to the word of God, so he's referring to the commandment of God, as the word of God, and he says, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things ye do. So what has priority or supremacy in our religion? Is it tradition, or is it the word of God? Well, based on the words of Christ here, 
It's the word of God that has uh, supremacy or preeminence above tradition. I'm not against traditions. We have a lot of traditions here, by the way. Many churches have traditions that they practice, but those traditions don't supersede the word of God. And now uh, he goes on. Uh, there's another one here. Let me get my notes. That's the next page. So these, uh, just go through these uh, next ones here uh, on your own. Look at the verses. I wanted, I didn't want to go and have us turn to every verse while we're going through the lesson, just to kind of keep them moving along uh, smoothly. But look up these references, and you'll, I'll go down real quick here. You do, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. There again, there's authority attached to the scriptures of the Old Testament. He accepted the flood account as given in Genesis. He validated the Genesis account of creation. He spoke of Jonah in the context of a historical narrative, not an allegory. He quoted from Isaiah, uh, the prophet, and so on. There are many, many examples along this line. So in the next page, page number 11, the first fill-in is Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 20. Let's turn there real quick because what I'm going to say after will springboard off of Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 20. Ephesians 2. And then we'll jump over to Peter if I want to read that too. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 20. And the Bible says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Look at verse number 20. What's he say here? He says that the foundation is built upon the apostles and prophets. What's my point here? The apostles have authority. The apostles have authority. Now, there's some people today that claim to be apostles. I've met people that claim to be apostles just like the apostles in the New Testament. And, of course, the Bible says, and I can't remember which church it was, but it was in the, uh, the seven churches of Revelation, and one of the churches was commended for trying those which said they were apostles, but found them to be liars. And Paul talks about the signs of an apostle over in Corinthians. And what are the signs of the apostle? It's mentioned in Mark chapter 16 what those signs are. But what happens a lot of times when you're dealing with those that claim to be apostles or have apostolic gifts, they pick and choose which gift they're going to use. Most of the time it's tongues, and a lot of times you'll hear reference to uh, being a healer. So again, we look at the Bible as an example, and we say, okay, can they model these healings, these miracles, just like the apostles did? And they can't. They can't do it, because when you look at how Christ healed and how the apostles healed, uh, they healed totally and completely. And Christ went everywhere indiscriminately healing people. You know, notice the healers today, you never see them going into hospitals and healing people that are sick. And... So I don't want to get down that road, but the point is the apostles were given certain apostolic gifts. And as you read Mark chapter 16, verse number 20, they confirmed the word with the signs following. So it was confirmation of the word that was given them by the Lord Jesus Christ, confirmed with that sign. So their authority is of value as we study out the scriptures. So Ephesians 2.20 is the first place it's going to go. The second is... In 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, and notice what it says here in 2 Peter chapter 3. I want you to see if you can pick up what he's saying, who this includes. So this is Peter, obviously an apostle, beginning in verse number 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye be mindful. So he's giving you a directive here. Be mindful. Be mindful of what? And be mindful of who? You see what he's doing in here? That ye be mindful of the words. Okay, so there's some words. The foundation's built upon what? The apostles. The apostles went everywhere preaching the word, doing what? confirming that word with signs following. If you want to dovetail into that, Matthew chapter 28, where Christ told them when he sent them out, teaching them to observe 
all things that I have taught you, or whatsoever I have taught you. So we see the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. So where's that directing us? To the Old Testament. See, he's validating the authenticity, the inspiration, the authority of the Old Testament. Now look, he's directing you forward. And of the commandment of us, of the, uh, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Commandments of the apostles. And what did he say over there in Mark? The commandment was what? The word of God. So should we isolate any one particular apostle and say, no, we should focus on just Paul? Or should we look at all of the apostles and glean from them what the Lord would have us to know? I believe that we should look at all of the apostles, and we have the authority to do that based on what the Bible says. Right? Self-authenticating. The next one, let's go to Jude. Jude. Jude 17. He says, remember the words of the apostles. Scripture with scripture, right? Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. So in Jude, look what he says here in verse number 17. But beloved, remember. So this is Jude now saying, remember ye what? The words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember those words. And Jude's a pretty significant chapter. I mean, it's the, it's the entryway into the book of Revelation, the, the vestibule to the book of Revelation. And there are some pretty harsh words found in the book of Jude. And one of which we see contending er earnestly for the faith. And so I guess the question could be asked this way. How could we contend earnestly if we only believe the Bible in part? If we only used a certain section of the Bible, I believe that all aspects of the Bible need to be brought to bear upon the current climate in religion today. It's all valid to some degree for the Christian in defense of the faith. And that is why systematic theology is important because it takes the whole Bible as a whole and studies out on a given subject rather than piecemeal. And so uh, the next one we see uh, is found down here in... Uh, we're going to go to Ephesians real quick. I didn't write the reference down. So turn to Ephesians. I'm using a different Bible this morning. Chapter 3. So Ephesians chapter 3. Make a note in your worksheets. It's Ephesians chapter 3. And I want you to see an outline here of inspiration. You know, see inspiration and preservation. And beginning at verse number one, Ephesians chapter three, the Bible says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me to you, word, how that revelation, or I'm sorry, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote before in few words. So Paul was given some words to speak. We see inspiration. And he goes on, verse 4, Whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So there's revelation, or a revealing, if you will, under the heading of inspiration. That's your first answer. And then the second, as I wrote before in few words. So we see the inspiration aspect of it. And then lastly, we see preservation, wherein, when you read. So the expectation is, obviously, if I'm going to inspire it, write it, then it needs to be preserved so that future generations can do what? Read. read. Exactly. And also to do what else with the Bible? Share it. To share it? Okay, what else? Study. Study the Bible. What else? Preach it, there you go. Memorize it, right? Contend for the faith with it. It's, it is our sword, is it not? 
What about what it does for us? As I started off in Romans 15, verse 4, it gives us hope for what? The promise. We, we can go to the Bible. We can find hope. Somebody in the world don't have hope. They don't have anything to anchor themselves to. Well, we have the sure word of God. We have the sure word of God. So everyone has those down? Yeah. Okay, great. And then in conclusion, there shouldn't be any blank spaces on your last page. But in conclusion, the Bible makes the claim that it is the word of God. This is not something that you just find in a couple hand-picked verses, although there are some verses that we like to quote and reference quite often. This is found throughout the scriptures. It is understood that when we read the scripture from Genesis to Revelation, that what we are reading is the very word of God, given by inspiration, penned by man over thousands of years from men who are from diverse backgrounds, diverse backgrounds in terms of their recreation, what they did for work, their education, and, and everything else. And God used those men mightily to give us the words that we have here. We see, for example, 3,800 times alone, thus saith the Lord, the Lord said, and other variations of this same statement. I referenced a couple of verses, and there are many more that you can find in the New Testament uh, as well, and in the Old Testament for that matter. Acts 20, 27, declaring all the counsel of God. Paul didn't declare just some of it. He declared all of it. It shows the relevance of all scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 13. Words in which the Spirit teacheth. Words. What do we have? We have the words of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 13. It's an excellent text. We receive it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in them that believe. It is the truth. It is the word of God. And then I'll reference uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number, um, four, I think it's 14 through 16, where he talks about young Timothy. And Timothy knew the scriptures from when he was a youth. And it was those scriptures that were able to make him wise unto salvation. And we see all of that evidence for inspiration contained within the Bible itself. And so as we get into next week and we talk about preservation, we're going to see the importance of preservation. God inspired his word and preserved it. And we have in our laps the preserved word of God. And we're going to close it out there. Father God, thank you so much for this time this morning. I, I pray, Lord, that the, the lesson came across clear and that the folks were able to follow along and understood understand what was spoken. God, give us the liberty and the grace to be able to grow in our knowledge of these things. Lord, that it might benefit us spiritually. And also, Lord, to help us as we deal with people in the world, uh, trying to share what we believe, why we believe it from the Bible. God, help us to hold these convictions fast and sure. We do pray in advance for our morning service. God, that you would be with us all and encourage us in the faith. Lord, and continue to show us uh, the things that we need to do to bring honor and glory to your name. And we ask this in Jesus' name.